Well, it's wonderful to be back with the online congregation. Great to be with you guys today. And by my estimation, it is Sunday, the 31st of October. And that means it's a very special day. It's the day when light comes to extinguish the darkness. And it's going to be a wonderful day. We're going to be celebrating God's love today as we think about his great gift to us in Jesus Christ. And that's what we're thinking about later on. We're going to be preaching a word on the love of God and thinking about what it means for God by his very nature to be loved. We're excited about that. And I'm also excited to be joined by one of my great friends, the incredible Mr. Matthew Reese. <laughs> so good to have you with us today, Matt. How are you? Um, very well, thank you. That's a lovely introduction. And it's a joy <laughs> to share this with you as well. We are good family are good and it's just great to be here so thank awesome. you for having us awesome we're going to be hearing a little bit more from matt later who's going to be telling us about his new venue in williston which is really really exciting but you know as i said earlier today is halloween this is a day when the world celebrates all kinds of crazy things people dress up as monsters as witches as wizards warlocks there are all sorts of strange creatures wandering around our streets on halloween night but we have to remember that this is a day of celebration this is a day like any other day where as christians we can remember the power of the cross we remember what jesus has accomplished with his death on the cross and his resurrection from the grave this is a good day to remember that the power of the kingdom it advances in every circumstance no matter what our tv companies what our media companies are pumping out scores of all sorts of films and strange images that promote and glorify the demonic realm on days like this we thank God that he has overcome all of the works of the enemy. They have been put under the feet of God's children and we have power in the great name of Jesus. And I love what Paul reminds us of in Colossians 1.13. He says that God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness. He has transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son, Jesus, who purchased our freedom and forgave us our sins. Isn't it wonderful that whether it's the 31st of October or any other day of the year, we can celebrate that we are rescued, we are forgiven, we are empowered, we are the children of God. So church, let's celebrate today that all God has done for us even on dark days like this. And if you have a testimony of the way that God has touched your life and rescued you from some dark sin or some dark background and brought you into the light, why don't you just drop a comment now in the comments box? We would love to hear from you. We would be so encouraged to hear your testimony. And I wanna remind you as well, we wanna share this service and get this as broadly broadcast as we possibly can. Sharing is caring. So why not take a little moment now just on your Facebook walls, just to paste a link for the service. We'd love your friends to hear what God is doing amongst us. But you know, before we do anything else, we wanna sing, we wanna glorify God, we wanna worship God, and we're gonna be thinking about some incredible themes this morning. In just a few minutes, we'll be thinking about the King of Kings. I love the words of this incredible worship song, that he came to reveal the kingdom coming, to reconcile the lost, to redeem the whole of creation. You did not despise the cross, for even in your suffering, you saw to the other side, knowing this was our salvation. Jesus, for our sake, you died. How wonderful to be able to worship together. But just before we do that, I'm gonna ask Matt to pray for us. And then I want you to jump to your feet, get off your sofas, raise your hands, lift your voices, and let's praise the King of Kings, Matt. Yes, Lord, we just thank you. You are the King of Kings. You are the Lord of Lords. You are the light of the world. You came down into darkness to give us hope Thank and you. to give us freedom. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are our living hope. You are the only one who can set us free from the darkness Amen. of this world. Thank you. Today we can celebrate you are light. You are the one who brings a fresh perspective mm. on a dry and barren world. And Lord, thank mm. you, you are the King of Kings. And that's a promise both today 
but into the future and forevermore. That these worship words we're going to declare now, they're not just but for a moment, but they're a, pom- a promise and a declaration Amen. of who you are into the future and forever will be. So thank you, God, that you have set us free. You have given us life. You're the light of the world. And we can look ahead with hope and deep joy of our King. We proclaim in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. In the darkness we were waiting Without hope, without light Till from heaven you came running There was mercy in your eyes To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt
That's a beautiful declaration. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring the praise of your glory for you are raised to life again. It is so wonderful that on days like this, we worship the risen King, the risen Savior, and we give him all the glory and praise that we can. Nothing can stand against the power of the Lord. You know, we are really excited today to have Matt with us. And Matt, I think there's been some really exciting developments in Douglas PM. What have you guys been up to? Well, we have just moved into our new venue up in the heart of Williston. We've been given a brand new church building we can use. It's been in the community for probably 60, 70 years. Wow. And uh, the Catholic Church uh, approached Living Hope and said, we have a building, would you like it? And we've said yes. <laughs> and we are tonight, tonight on this day will be the third service of our kind of launch into the new area. And my goodness, it's been so exciting so far. So that's just a snippet of a little bit of what we've that been up to. Fantastic. So, so good. I mean, obviously you guys have been meeting, um, not on the fringes of Douglas, but you've been meeting kind of off the trodden path a little bit mm. in the old Friends Association. And what kind of difference do you think it means to move into a venue that is actually located within the heart of the community? Does that change things for you? Have you seen any, any big changes? Yeah, massively. I mean, in the hearts of the people, I would say this, I feel they're hope filled. The church has just got this sense that God is going to do a new thing. And I totally agree with them. I believe that we are going to see new life, new people. And uh, I feel people are marveling at this opportunity. Like sometimes I think we lose the wonder of who God is. Maybe you followed God for a long time and uh, you can forget the great miracles and the great things he's done. And, you know, in scripture, they put piles of stones and they, they told their children continually who God was. And I think at the moment we're in a marvel moment. Like, wow, what an opportunity. I think it's stretching people's faith. You know, as you and said, we were uh, off the beaten track. We were in a quiet part of Douglas on a Sunday night. Now we are in the heart of a community. And I think people can sense that we are in one of the biggest communities in Douglas. And there's so much opportunity. The people are loving having a new home, a new identity. But I believe ultimately what I love that God is doing is people are believing God for more. It's actually stretching my faith. It, you know, I, I believe we need to be a people mm. who believe and trust God for more. And uh, I feel we're beginning to even see that. We've so today will be our third service. The last two weeks, we have had new people coming in so every good. week. And uh, what I love about the community of Williston, where we are, is people are just walking in. So we've had three new adults who've just walked in. They've seen the doors are open. And uh, as we think of light today, um, you know, don't put your light under a lamp. You're a city on a hill. And I really believe that this church building we've been given and as a congregation we're meeting is a light to the lost, is a light mm. in the darkness. And even as it's the cold, dark Isle of Man winters, we have our lights on and it's us saying, we are here with the hope and the good news of Jesus. Um, we've seen parents just sending their children. So even we've had some um, young children coming to church saying, my mom and dad have just sent me here to come to church. And I believe that God is gonna do something new in the life of these children as well. So we're seeing this and our, our doors are wide open into a hungry community. So what I would probably would say, Yuan, is what God's doing in PM. I think people's hearts for the lost are being reawakened again. Um, you know, as, as a church, you know, we love to gather. We love to say we're all about reaching lost people, but it's so easy to creep into our own comfort. Oh yeah, I, I know I'm doing okay. Mm. And life is quite hard at the moment anyway. You know, this is, it's a challenging season. And I think we can so often forget that God came for the one, yeah. um, not just the 99 righteous who are set aside, but the one lost sheep. And I really sense at the moment for us, what is God doing in the community? What are opportunities? We are seeing the ones coming through our doors. We're seeing prodigals return back who so haven't good. been in church for a long time. And uh, yeah, I just sense it's a really exciting opportunity and something different. You know, it's very rare for any of our congregations that people just wander in. But I really am in faith. We're going to see so many wonders in. And, you know, one lady who came the first week told her neighbor, there's a church here. Come along. She's not saved, but she's inviting that's people so to church. And I believe, yeah. So that's a little bit of what's going on in, in the community at the moment in Douglas PM. We're on week three, so do be praying for us. Um, I really believe this is a miraculous opportunity that has opened up. The, the Catholic Church have been so generous. And uh, I just feel it's for this season. We tried so long to get a building across the island in many places. And this has come so quick, ridiculously quick, to be honest. 
but I believe it's a God thing and you're going to be hearing great testimonies of what God is doing through this building and through the people of God reaching the lost who need a saviour. Oh, that is just awesome. That is so, so inspiring. And I mean, this venue is not just a venue for Sunday use. We're talking about a 24-7 yes. facility that can be used all through the week. You can do all sorts of kind of, you know, events in there. And I love what you were saying earlier that you've even seen parents who are sending children. They're obviously seeing it as a safe space somewhere that kids can come to worship. And we really pray that that's gonna have a knock-on impact into whole families. Yeah. We wanna see family salvations, not just children saved. We wanna see whole families coming to God mm. through the work that you're doing in Williston. And it sounds like your, your heart is on fire for the lost. It sounds like <laughs> the Lord is raising up Matt the Evangelist at the moment. <laughs> I mean, what, what are you kind of feeling? Is that something that's in you? Or do you sense that that's in the whole congregation? that the love for the lost is something that the Lord's really pressing on you guys yeah. at the moment. I would say it's something that's stirring. I mean, I've uh, I've been in church all my life for 27 years. Um, yeah, I've been working for the church now for eight, nine years. Um, and I believe sometimes just when you're in church, it's so easy to get swept along in, in church life, you know, in, in, in doing the kind of the serving and the rope is making everything look okay. And, you know, we get all these ideas of what is church. And I believe sometimes we just forget, you yeah. know, that the church has a calling to reach the lost. The church is the one thing that the Lord has left behind to reach the, the people who are dying and perishing. So I, I guess what I really sense for me personally is that reminder um, that we are called to mission. We are called to go into the world and make disciples of all nations and, and teaching them the ways of Christ, baptizing them in the, in the name of Jesus and praying for them to be full of the Holy Spirit. So I feel for us personally, you know, we've, we've done quite a big move. I I am just uh, like terrible at decorating places. Like I'm <laughs> thankful for my wife who's helped the home. It just doesn't mean, so, you know, we've, we've had all these mechanical things, you know, we've got chairs, we've got the sound equipment, all this. But for me, that doesn't excite me. I think the thing that yeah. excites me is the potential that yeah. new people could come to know Jesus, the potential for a home where people can deepen their relationship with Jesus. And, you know, if you're on the Isle of Man, come along, come and check out our venue on Sunday night or be around. It's going to be used throughout the week for other things as well in the life of the church. So I'm excited for that. I feel the congregation as well. Um, you know, people have come to me with ideas, you know, what about if we do this? This would be a great way of reaching people. Mm. What if we do this? So, um, you know, even tonight, um, it is uh, Halloween night and we know there's going to be people walking around. So we're going to be out the front. We're going to have food. We're going to have drinks for people in the community. We just want to say we're here. We so love good. you. Come and come and check out our church. So I feel people have got this stirring in their heart of, well, who can we reach? Who can we bring? And we've seen new people bringing others to church as well. Um, you know, I, I almost feel like in the last three weeks, we've had more guests than the rest of the year, which is kind of embarrassing to say, but I just sense there's a, a new thing. But, you know, I think in that scripture, you know, the fields are white for harvest. Yeah. You know, that's the scripture we prophesy. The labor, the labor is a few, but the fields are, are ripe and white for harvest. And I, I believe it. And I sense the congregation sense that as well. And sometimes we hear that scripture and just think, Oh, well, it's quite hard. I've tried sharing my faith before mm. with people mm. and oh, they haven't believed. But I believe this scripture and I believe the fields are ripe for harvest. We're going to see new people coming yeah. to know Christ. So that's what I sense is, is going on and just grabbing that heart again. And I encourage you at home, just ask the Lord, Lord, please just shape in my heart, a heart for the lost, yeah. a heart for the perishing. When we're saved, you know, we're happy. We love, we're creatures of comfort. I love being comfortable. Let's be honest. No one loves stepping out. Yeah. But I think just remind us, Lord, there's people who are really uncomfortable in the eternity to come. I yeah. may be safe, but it's hard to think into the next life, into the eternal life when we pass away from this life into the next. But people are perishing. People right. are dying. And right. I feel the Lord just in birthing in my heart and the congregation. What are we going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? How how can I continue to pray? How can I continue to reach others? How can I keep trying, keep on trying and keep on inviting, encouraging, bringing people into the house, sharing my faith and sharing my life with them? So, yeah, I would say you and my heart's really been challenged in this season. How am I bringing the lost into my life? Even in the week, you know, yeah. who am I? grabbing that coffee with or inviting around the house or using any means possible to connect with them so I can just share Jesus. So I feel that's what's going on in me. It's going on in the congregation and uh, just encourage you at home. 
Ask the Lord, Lord, give me a heart mm. for the lost, the perishing, mm. those who are unseen in my community. And I just also wanted to share with those online. Maybe you feel like you can't go out at the moment, but you do have a neighbor next door. Unless you live in the middle of the sticks and you've just got sheep around you. Like you do have a neighbor next door. And uh, maybe you're unable to go out at the moment, but you know, just knock on the neighbor's door or let them know you're there. Let them know you're praying yeah. for them. Reach out to them and uh, love your neighbor as, yeah, as you love yourself. So yeah. that's what's going on in my life in the congregation. It's a great time. <laughs> that is so awesome. Just as you were speaking, I was kind of reminded of um, like moving into a house in Glen Helen. It's a much bigger house than we'd come from in Edinburgh. And I remember our big challenge was we needed to furnish the second floor of this house. <laughs> we could only manage furniture for the first floor. And the thing is that I remember now like spending so long meticulously cha you know, choosing which chairs we'd have, the sofas that we'd have, but those sofas are no good to anyone if there are no people in them. Yeah, that's right. And the problem is we become acclimatized to having sofas and furniture, but the church is not about the seats. Yeah. The church is about the people that sit in those seats. And so I think good. the bigger challenge for the wider church that you're raising for us is we're not inviting people to come and see a new building. Yeah. We're inviting people to come and see the King of Kings that's and to right. meet Jesus. And that same Jesus is in Williston, is in Peel, is in Port St. Mary, is in Douglas, is in yes. Ramsey. Amen. And we've got to have bringers hearts. We've got to get people to come and encounter the living God, Jesus. But man, it's been so inspiring just Thank hearing the, the heart that you have for the community. And I'm sure that's going to just infect your whole congregation. And we are excited to hear week on week stories mm. about lost people finding Jesus. And it feels to me like it's virgin territory almost. Yeah, I mean, Williston right. is a largely untouched area really with the gospel. Mm. And so we, we're just excited to, to see God move in this way and to touch new families, to touch new lives. Yes. And we are praying for you guys. We're with you guys and trusting for a mighty harvest Thank you. <laughs> that will radically change the profile of our island. But why don't we just pray for Matt? If you're at home, you can just join and pray with me as we pray over the Douglas PM congregation. Father God, we are so thankful for your provision. We know that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are the one that provides all that we need. And Lord, we want to give you thanks for um, those people in the Catholic Church that have been generous towards your people in living hope. And we want to bless them. Yes. And we praise you, Lord, for their partnership in the gospel. And Lord, we ask for such an anointing on Douglas PM. We ask, Lord, for inspirational ideas. We ask, Lord, for a new level of compassion and love for the lost community of Williston. We ask, Lord, that right across the board, from saints to deacons to elders, that there would be a passion for new people to come and not just see a church building, but see the king that occupies yes, that building. Amen. And we pray for fruitfulness over Matt. We pray for fruitfulness over Stuart and the wider team there, Lord God. We ask for your anointing on them. We pray, Lord, that whenever the gospel goes out in Williston, that it would achieve all it was set out amen. to accomplish, that new people would give their hearts to Jesus amen. weekly and even daily, Lord. We pray that there would be a mighty, mighty harvest. So Lord, would you do it? We know that you are the God yes, of great revivals. And so we ask now, Lord God, that you would just speak the name of Jesus mm -hmm. over that community Amen. and that lives would be touched, that hearts would be healed, that lives would be restored, that the brokenhearted would be bound up and their wounds would be tended to you, and would be healed for your glory. And we pray it all in your mighty powerful name jesus we praise you and give you all the glory for what you're doing in williston at the moment so praise you god and help us we ask in the work that you're doing there in jesus name we pray amen amen man it, it's been so good just to listen to you and hear what's going on in your heart it's uh, matt is such an inspirational character he loves the lord with a great passion as you can see and i, I just love spending time with you love catching what the Lord has put on you. So we pray great blessing Thank over you. you and the work in Williston. But guys, it's time to worship again. We're gonna sing a great song of praise. And this is a song that could be an anthem for Williston. I speak the name yeah. of Jesus into all of those dark places on the island. We ask that the powerful, mighty name of Jesus would pervade every home, every dark place, every heart, that Lord, you would go and the name of Jesus would be proclaimed 
over our island. So if you're at home, why don't you jump to your feet, raise your hands, and let's shout the name of Jesus today and bring great glory to him. I just want to speak the name of Jesus Over every heart and every mind And I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus And I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power your name is healing your name is life break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire i just want Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Shout Jesus from the mountains, Jesus in the streets. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name, Jesus. Your name is power, your name is healing, your name Shadows, the light of fire. 
Well, it is great to shout loudly and proclaim the name of Jesus. We have so much life to celebrate. And in our family here in Living Hope, I want to share some family news, new life. What are we up to? What's going on? So I know you're at home. Give that shout. Family news. It's time to celebrate. Well, on Thursday this week, it is our deep joy to have our daytime congregation. Now our daytime congregation is for our MMMs, the more <laughs> mature members. And I'll put Am Matt because I go along every week <laughs> as every month as well. And it's absolutely wonderful. And it's probably one of my favorite things I do in my month. I love being with the more mature members of the church. Just such a lovely group of people. They have such a deep devotion to Jesus. They're so faithful to him. There's such a caring heart for one another. And I, 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 I love it. It really inspires me. Every time I go, I leave, wow, what an inspiration to spend time with this group of people. And I want to encourage you, um, why not come down and join us? If you're, if you're free at Thursday at two o'clock, we're going to be at Project 21 Center. And it's an opportunity to gather, to worship together. They do great cake. That is always a good reason to go as well. And just have fellowship with one another and just share in that moment. And maybe you have a neighbor who's maybe a little bit more senior. You could invite them along as well. Hey, an opportunity to get to know others, to talk about Jesus. And uh, I'm going to be bringing a word on Thursday. And I, I really sense it's just going to stir something up in this this community, this, this gathering in the church. And I, I would love to see you there this Thursday. And talking of what else is going on in gatherings, we have one coming up. Yes. One. Everyone loves one. So on the 14th of November, we are going to be gathering on the Island Man, all of our congregations together in the Villa Marina at half past 10. I usually go to church in the evening, so I have to get out of bed, <laughs> wake up and get ready to go. But I'm excited to share. We have Ashley Gabriel coming over from the UK. He is the lead elder of Ark Furrock and a fantastic man of God, one of my best buddies in the kingdom. He always inspires me. Anytime I speak to him, I feel like I just want to get closer to Jesus. I want to run harder for my King of Kings. I want to tell more people about Jesus. So we're going to have a great time with Ashley here over that weekend. But on one, he's going to be sharing a word, which I know is going to just bring new life to you and also to your friends you bring along as well. You know, one is the best service I feel for unsafe friends to come along. We just see loads of people bringing the unsafe friends and people just feel a bit more at ease coming into the Villa Marina. And also we see prodigals coming back. So I want to encourage you at home. Who can you invite? Who could you even be thinking now? It's a few weeks till one. Who can I bring and also in that day we're going to have a bit of a gospel feel it's going to be part of the worship which is going to be great fun and also we're going to be taking up an act of remembrance as well an important part of our worship that day um, so do bring your friends along and of course our children will be out in their thriving kids ministry i love what god is doing in our children so that's one in two weeks time and then finally we have our deliverance equipped, which I know you and the team are going to be leading, which is great. I'll tell you from my personal experience, I've experienced some deliverance before and it has transformed my life. It's brought new freedom. And the hope is that others as well, other believers, other followers of Jesus can experience the deliverance and freedom of that which mm. is come against them. And uh, I want to encourage you, this is going to be a great equip for both the leader and the saint. Maybe you've had lots of experience in deliverance before. Maybe you know nothing. We're going to be looking at the foundations from the Bible of what is deliverance. Um, we're going to be looking at how can we be affected by the demonic and also how can we be set free and remain free. That's going to be for three weeks kicking off the 16th of October up in Williston actually in the heart of Williston. So come and join us. Come and see our new venue and uh, come and be equipped for all God wants to do in deliverance. And we have one more exciting piece of family news, which Ewan's going to do. Yeah. 
Now that's wonderful. Thank you so much, Matt. We are really excited to bring some great news about leadership expansion to you. And over the past number of months, we've been really encouraged to see the work that we are doing on a monthly basis into the beautiful seaside town of Laxey, gaining some kind of growth and traction. And as we continue to meet there once a month, one of the things that we um, regard as important as we look to plant a congregation into Laxey is we need to raise up leaders. And we've been so encouraged by the leadership qualities that we recognize in the amazing James and Anna Smead. And James and Anna, as many of you will know, have served the church for many, many years in multiple capacities. We've been blessed by their devotion and commitment to the house of God. They've served in so many areas, children's and youth ministries, worship, evangelism and teaching. And more recently, we are seeing their giftedness in congregational leadership as they spearhead the work into Laxey. And we believe that according to the scriptures, it's absolutely vital that as we plant churches into different regions, we need to raise up elders to lead, to bring vision to the church, to direct the church, to protect the flock, and to care for the people that God entrusts to us. Indeed, if we look at the scriptures, and particularly as we walk through the book of Acts, we see that Paul and Barnabas continued to plant churches throughout ancient Turkey. And in Acts 14, 23, we read that they appointed elders for the people in each church and with prayer and fasting committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. And one of the things that we've enjoyed doing in recent months is exploring the possibility of James and Anna joining our eldership team within the Living Hope Church. And have we've been so encouraged by what we've seen, their love for the house, their love for people, and ultimately their great desire to serve Jesus in a greater leadership capacity. So after much prayer and much discipleship and consultation with our wider 412 leadership team, we are really excited to be able to recommend this wonderful family to you that we have the intention of welcoming them into eldership on Sunday the 14th of November where we have the wonderful Ashley as Matt said at one we want to welcome them in there and in the time running up to that we want to encourage you please pray for our great friends, the Smeads. And if you feel that the Lord has given you a word of encouragement for them, then I would just ask you to share that with your congregational leader so it can be fed back to them to build them up. But we are really excited. We are so pleased to be able to recommend a quality, quality family to you for eldership. And I wanna pray for them right now. Father God, we thank you so much for James and Anna. We thank you, Lord, for the great work that you have done in their hearts. We thank you, Lord, for the foundations of theology school and Bible school. We thank you, Lord, for the foundations of being a part of a church family and raising their own children in the house of God in such a great way. We wanna pray, Lord, for vision and for inspiration for them as they continue to lead the team working into Laxey. And Lord, we ask for fruitfulness. We ask, Lord, for even greater growth in the town of Laxey. We ask, Lord, that we would see many people come to know you and many lost souls become saved with an internal inheritance from you as they find you and discover the joy of salvation through Jesus. So Lord, we commit this family to you. We ask for your anointing on their lives. We ask that you would give them the capacity they need to lead, Lord. We ask as well, Father, that you would bless them and pour out your peace over them as they continue to serve you. So Lord, we commit them to you. We ask for your hand to be upon them in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen. Amen. And you know, uh... One of the other ways we can worship God, not just through singing, but actually is in our finances. And we're going to take up our offering as part of our online congregation today. And uh, this is for the Living Hope family. So if you're joining us online from somewhere else, you're part of another church. Hey, it's good to have you with us. But this is not for you. This is for our Living Hope family who call the Living Hope Church 
their home. And you'll see on the screen, there's ways you can you can put your tithes and offerings into the church. We have our online banking here on the screen. You can also use PayPal and other means. And I'm sure if you want to find any other ways you can sow into the life of the church or you want to know, actually, I'm giving finance, but how is it making an impact into Living Hope and, and the wider island and things are involved in, then do get in contact with us info at livinghope.im and I'm sure we'd love to share a little bit of heart further with you what is going on. But I want to share an offering scripture with you today, which I think is so powerful and so in line actually with what God's been speaking to us. It says this, if then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And what's it saying here? Well, the true riches is people. It's it's hearts transformed in Jesus. That's a true richness. And, uh, you know, I think we can put our pennies into things which perish, you know, and invest in stuff which isn't going to last. But people are the unperishable and they will last into eternity. And we need to long for them to be with the Lord. So this scripture actually is challenging us. If we can't be faithful in returning our tithes and offerings and bringing back to God that which is his and he's given to us, then what about the people who are around us actually... There's so much more for us. And this is just a lens into us that we say, God, we trust you with this. And I trust you with others around us as well. So as we return our our tithes and offerings, you're going to see a great testimony video from a lad called Jack Lewis, actually in Ewan's congregation in uh, West AM. A fantastic young man. God is doing a new thing in his life. Mm. And uh, he has a real heart for the things that won't perish, for people. And this testimony video is just a little story of him reaching others in the name of Jesus. So as you return your tithes and offerings, enjoy this testimony video. Hi, my name is Jack and this is the story of my coming to faith in Jesus. I'd never really questioned if there was more to life. I was just happy going along with the crowd and basically living an average person's life. I'd not been raised going to church or with a particular emphasis of a life of faith, but I had grown up knowing about Jesus and God, but never thought of it as anything more than just a story. I never ever thought it would have the biggest influence on my life. One summer evening a few years ago, My friend had told me that he was going to a Christian group, which at the time was super annoying as my friend had just passed his driving test. So in order to not miss out on anything, I decided to go along. At first it seemed okay, but they then started to sing and worship and even read the Bible, which definitely wasn't for me. I continued going where I was able to find out more about this God and Jesus, who up until this point was just a swear word. I remained doubtful for a long time, but as time went on, I started to come to my own conclusion that God was real and Jesus was who he said he was. Some time passed and during a time of worship, someone came to me and told me that they felt God was saying he wanted me to give my life to Jesus. I thought about it for a moment and reluctantly said yes, thinking it would have no impact on me. I prayed to God asking for him to forgive me of my sins, that I believed Jesus was Lord and God raised him from the dead and finally for him to come into my life. All of a sudden, the head knowledge that I had taken in dropped to my heart and I felt a sudden peace and joy where I couldn't stop smiling. It was the most real experience of joy I'd ever felt. Since that point, I've gone on to get baptised, attend church and have a life full of purpose that is so much more than to just eat, sleep, work and repeat. I've learned so much more about what it means to be a Christian as not to be an attender of church and live a well-behaved life, but to love God and share the hope of Jesus to others. I feel like there are so many people out there similar to me who know the story of God and Jesus but have never looked into faith themselves due to being too busy or seeming like too much of a deep subject to approach. People often say, I need evidence to believe, but these are the questions that science can never answer or prove. We can know when and how, but not who or why. I firmly believe that life is not random, the vast life we live in, the 200 billion trillion stars we have in the universe, the beauty of the sunset and the delicacy of a flower. Just like an art piece, there surely must be a creator. Receiving Jesus into my heart has been the best decision I've ever made. I don't want a single person to miss out on the amazing free gift of grace that God has given us. In John 3.16 it says that God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God allowed his son to die so that our sin, our biggest mistakes in life, can be forgiven and allow us to have a clean slate. It is from this and only this we can have eternal life.
Yes, thank you, Lord. We have the opportunity to be generous. Mm. Thank you. We have the opportunity to return our tithes. And I pray a blessing on everyone, Lord, who is sowing into the life of the church. Lord, I pray, God, that they will experience your presence afresh today. And Lord, I pray that you will entrust to them the things which are not mm. perishable, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that they will have great conversations this week with those who are on their heart to find you. And uh, Lord, I pray there'll be testimonies rising up. As I trusted you with my finances, I also saw those who I'm praying for to know the Lord come to know mm. you. So do a new thing, we pray in Jesus' name. Thank you for the generosity and the hearts of those giving yes. into the life of the church. And Lord, we pray that every penny will reach the lost and perishing mm. and strengthen the bride of Christ. Mm. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, it's great joy. Ewan is here to bring a word today on one love and uh, it's going to be fantastic. I know this is a strong word in his heart and I just encourage you at home, open your hearts up to this message. Say, God, I want to hear from you. God, I'm desperate to know you more. And uh, Lord, what are you saying to us today? So I'm going to pray for Ewan and then we're going to enjoy this word. Lord, we thank you for Ewan. We thank you, God, for this man. Thank you for his heart, his desire to follow you, his passion for the Lord. And I pray as he preaches now, Lord, I pray this word will open up our hearts afresh and give us a new revelation of who you are. Lord, use his words with great strength and power. And Lord, we pray today will be a day of salvation, will be a day of freedom, and will be a day of victory in the cross of Jesus Christ. Use him now and may his words proclaim into our very being the truth of who you are, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. It's been so wonderful today just to hear from Jack, to hear from Matt, to hear these various testimonies to the goodness of God. And we're going to be thinking about that right now as we consider the great love of God. You know, one of the joys for me growing up as a child in the 1980s, I know that's hard for you to believe, was the excitement of TV advertising because we're growing up in a culture now where advertising is generally something that we want to block out. We don't want pop-ups coming up on our media. We want to get rid of advertising. But as an 80s child, let me tell you, advertising was extraordinary. And there were particular favorites that I had. Many of the people my age watching today will absolutely remember these adverts. My favorite possibly was the Hamlet cigar adverts. The man with the toupee trying to get his passport photo taken and slipping down in the chair, the toupee falling off. But if you smoke a Hamlet cigar, the world is sweet. We had the incredible PG tips, chimpanzees doing all sorts of crazy adverts. Brooke Bond, it was amazing. My personal favorite advert though was the inspirational Coca-Cola advert where the guy came on playing slide guitar with a Coke bottle and I just knew that is the way to get girlfriends. So children, if you're watching at home today, slide guitar is the way forward. I'm just kidding, it isn't of course. But you know, if there is one advertising campaign that topped the lot, then it was, of course, the incredible milk tray advertising campaign. I mean, this was literally a 30 second Bond movie. It began with our hero performing the most tremendous 80 foot cliff dive into the sea. He would then be attacked and tussle with a great white shark and use a little pen knife to kill the shark before our chocolate carrying James Bond broke into the boat where he could deliver the package to his mysterious, beautiful Bond girl. And of course, he did all this because the lady loves milk tree. I just loved the whole premise of that campaign that our legendary hero would literally risk life and limb in order to demonstrate his great love for his friend. You know, it's amazing, I think, the lengths that people go to in order to demonstrate love to one another. And there was one particular story that caught my eye this week as I was scanning the internet for great acts of love. And it was about a Russian man whose name was Alexei Baikov. And he had actually hired a movie director and stunt team in order to come and facilitate his great attempt to secure his girlfriend's hand in marriage. And what he had decided to do, and he thought this would be a good idea, I suggest you don't do this at home, is he would fake his own death. Now, Alexei's girlfriend, Arena, arrived to meet him at a prearranged location, but when she got there, to her horror, she arrived at the scene of a car crash with mangled vehicles all over the place. 
She asked the paramedic to come and help her. What has happened? And she learned, sadly, that Alexi had died. Well, she was heartbroken and she was taken over to Alexi's dead body where she began to weep over him. And then to her great surprise and probably horror, Alexi jumped back to his feet and he proposed to her, will you marry me? And she says she was so cross that she almost killed him again, but for real this time. She described the event as the most incredible experience of shock. And oh, it was lovely. But I think it's wild, isn't it? How far we would go to demonstrate love. And yet I wonder, I wonder if God has ever looked at the earth and found a man or a woman or a child and said, yes, you've got it now. Now you are loving just the way that I want you to. You see, I think actually that the way God loves is far greater than even the things that we can imagine in our own minds. You see, we are creatures of habit. We actually find it easier to give love to people that we regard as being deserving recipients. We think that love is perhaps easier to give to people that we like. It's easy to love people who will give us something in return, but actually that's not the way that God loves because the love of God can't be earned by our good behavior. It cannot be repaid. We cannot afford to pay back what God has done for us. And God does not love us so that he can be rewarded by us. I mean, listen to the words of Paul's beautiful description of God's love in Romans 5, 8. He says that God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, that means that we were powerless against sin. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And if you are watching today and you're sitting at home and you're, you're thinking, well, I know that God loves people, but he could never love me because of the things that I have done, then I have great news for you today. You see, God doesn't love because of the way that you are. God loves because of the way that he is. He is actually, by his very nature, love. Over the past few weeks in the McRae household, we have this hot spot in the year where everyone seems to have a birthday, except Karen for some reason. She's a June baby, but the rest of us are all October, September and November babies. And one of the things I love about this time of year is just trying to think of creative presents for my children. And the kids are generally really good at asking for presents. They normally ask for things that there is no way we can afford, but that's okay. We can buy the miniature versions of the things that they like. Connor wants an Aston Martin, so he can have a miniature Aston Martin. That's how it works. But one of the things that frustrates my children is every time they ask dad, what can we buy you for your birthday? Now, the truth is that I have reached an age where I genuinely need nothing. I lack nothing. There is nothing that my children can afford that I would want from them. But I think they find it hard when they say to dad, well, what can we get you? And I say, I don't need anything. And they will always say to me, but you buy us presents. Uh, and that is absolutely true. And I give to my children because they have a need. But our relationship is not a kind of tit for tat affair. That's not the way that it works. I love them because I, I, I buy them presents because I love them, but I don't want anything in return. The only thing that I need from my children is their hearts. The only thing that they can give me is to have relationship with me. That's what I long for with my kids. And the same is true of God. God needs nothing from us, but he longs for our hearts. He longs for relationship. It's why we were created. We were created to be loved by him and in return to worship him and to love him. You know, the world, I think, has a very different view of love to the Bible. The world actually has this definition of love. It says it's an intense feeling of deep affection, an intense feeling of deep affection, which sounds like a reasonable assumption. But the problem with feelings is that they change. Our feelings are like the seasons. They move from one season to the next. They, they change moment by moment. But the love and the compassion that God has for his children does not blow about in the wind. The love and compassion that God has for you and for me is a consistent love because God is unchanging. And if we were to define what biblical love really is, 
and what God really is, it would be perhaps to say this, that to love is to exist in a self-giving state for the benefit of others. Hopefully you can grasp that. It's to always be giving out for the benefit of the people who receive love from us. And that means that the nature of God is a bit like a constant waterfall, that his love is always pouring over his children. It's always pouring into us, but it it never stops flowing, but it's not sustained by what we return to him. It's sustained by who he is. It's sustained by his nature and his character that he loves us in spite of the people that we are. And we see God's great love for us demonstrated nowhere better than at the cross. And so I want us to jump back 2000 years into time, right to that moment where Jesus has been pinned to the cross at Calvary or Golgotha, the place of the skull where he is about to be brutally killed. And crucifixion, you see, was a particularly brutal form of torture. And by the time that Jesus was pinned to the cross, he'd actually already faced a number of false trials where he was falsely accused, falsely condemned. He'd had the beard that was growing from his face actually plucked out of the skin. Can you imagine the immense pain of having that removed? He had been scourged by the Romans' favorite weapon of choice, the cat of nine tail, a whip with nine leather straps seven feet long on it that would contain ball bearings to break the bones of its victims and bone in the end of those straps to pull the skin of the person that was being beaten. But of course, crucifixion and the Roman torture was not just a physical torture because by this moment, Jesus had been emotionally tormented. He had been spat upon. He had been mocked. He had had a crown of two inch thorns pressed into the crest of his brow to mock the king that we know he is. Imagine that's you. Imagine that you were hanging on the cross where you should have been and where I should have been. See, Jesus took that cross for us, but it should have been us. And imagine as you hang on the cross that was for you and you look out on the crowd of people that are there and you notice that only one of your closest 11 friends has come to support you and love you. How would that feel? Can you imagine what it would feel like in those moments to be abandoned. You know, the fact is that Jesus being alive at this point was miraculous in itself. To hang on that cross for a further six hours was supernatural. It was quite mind-blowing. And I want to pick up from the Word of God in John chapter 19, verses 25 to 27 today. And we read these words. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple, John, whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, he said, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Now, at this point, Joseph, the husband of Mary, has been dead for some time. We don't know exactly when he died, but it was somewhere between the ages of 12 and 30 for Jesus. Mary lived actually a further 12 years as a widow after the point that her son Jesus was killed on the cross. And for 12 years, the Apostle John, Jesus' closest friend on earth, took Mary into his home and he treated her just like family. And that's going to be really important for us to understand today as we begin to learn how we ourselves can begin to love like Jesus. And the truth is this, nobody can love like Jesus if the presence of Jesus is not in them. It's only when the grace of the Spirit of God and the power of the resurrection flows in us that we can truly start to live like Jesus. But today I want to look at four ways that will help us to start to conform more and more into the likeness of Christ Jesus in this area. And firstly, to love like Jesus means that I must care for my own family. 
It all starts in the home. You see, there are certain things in this life that I will always be able to get more of. There are certain things in this life that if I am desperate enough, I will be able to retrieve them to me. If I need more money, I'll find ways to make more money. If I want to give people greater gifts, I will be more generous to them. But there is one commodity, there is one substance in this life that cannot be purchased, and that is time. We can never get time back. Once it has gone, it's gone forever. And it's something in my household that we're very conscious of at the moment because our eldest daughter, Holly, is now on the countdown clock to university. She's taken a year out to work, to make a little bit of money, to hopefully pay for her education next year. But we are so aware at the moment that in in approximately nine or 10 months, Our eldest daughter is going to leave home. She's fleeing the nest. And there is a great pain to me as a parent thinking about that. But, you know, it's changed my relationship with Holly because now I kind of think, well, I've got these 10 months where she must have my undivided attention. Whenever she needs me, I'm going to notice her. Whenever she calls for me, I'm not going to say I'm too busy or I'm working or I'm dealing with somebody from the church. No, she is going to have my undivided attention and I will see her because I know that once this time is gone, I will never be able to reclaim it. Now, if we think about that, but we go to the cross of Christ Jesus, think about what is happening in that moment. Who was there? Who was present? There were 12 followers of Jesus, 12 disciples that could have been there, but one had already taken his life on a tree for his betrayal of Jesus. But there were 11 others that could have been there. One of them, Peter, has already betrayed Jesus and abandoned him. But what of the other 10? Where were they? Well, only one of them, only one of his closest friends found himself at the cross that day. But there were others. There were the women. Now, why would the women be at the cross? Why were they there when the men weren't? Well, the thing was, in Roman culture, women were treated like dogs. Women actually had no rights. They were never noticed. And if you're a woman today, believe me, you need to thank Jesus for the way that he transformed, the way that we value and think of women. He literally turned the world on its head in this area. But the women were there because the Roman soldiers wouldn't notice them. They would pay no attention to them. They were treated just like dogs. But one person saw them. One person noticed who was there that day. And it was the man who was hanging on the cross for them. And he gave special attention, not just to those who were his closest family members, but to those that were there that day who were so often overlooked. And if there is one secret to loving like Jesus, it is surely that when people are overlooked, the people of God must step up and begin to notice the unnoticeable to love the unlovable, to reach the unreachable, and to touch and care for the untouchable. You know, I love what Paul says to Timothy in his letter in 1 Timothy 5, 3 to 4. He says, give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. Can you see it? God has clear expectations of the way that we should care for our family. And the first thing he says is notice the widows. The people that are so often overlooked, even in our church congregations, are we caring for those who are going through a time of loss? They are family to us. And God is calling us to notice them. You know, by the time that Jesus was crucified, Mary has been widowed at this stage for some period. But even in those dying moments, Jesus locked his attention on his mum. He noticed Mary and he gave her his undivided attention. Even as life was draining out of his body, his eyes were locked on her. He had nothing to give her, no money, no clothing. He couldn't give her shelter. But there was one thing that Jesus could do that day. He could give Mary his best friend, John. 
Now we are called as people of God and children of God to care for our own flesh and blood family. In fact, it's so serious that Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5, 8, and I want you to grasp this because it's such a deep scripture. The word says anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Isn't that a profound scripture? You know, currently in our home, we have my, one of my favorite people in the world, Roy, my father-in-law, living with us, Karen's dad and Adrian's dad. And Roy is waiting to move into accommodation on the Isle of Man up in Ramsey. And um, he has nowhere to stay at the moment. He's effectively homeless. Now, if we were not to take him in and to love him and to care for him willingly, we would be worse than unbelievers. We would deny the very faith that we believe God has called us to live out. And so it's a joy for us to have this great man of God staying with us. But hopefully he'll have a home by Christmas time and then we can go and stay with him. But family is family and to love like Jesus means that we care for those who are in need. We care for the ones who go unnoticed. That is the way that family functions. I love the words of the writer of Proverbs in 1717 who says that friends love through all kinds of weather and families stick together in all kinds of trouble. You know, whatever cross you bear today, whatever it is that you are going through, Remember to care for your flesh and blood family. But here's the thing. Jesus wants us to think more broadly about who family actually is. And the second thing I want you to know today is to love like Jesus means that I must love other believers as family. And I think for some of us, loving our flesh and blood family is an easy thing. For Perhaps for some of you, it's an incredibly difficult thing to do. But we are to love other believers with a special love. And you will have heard the phrase in life that blood is thicker than water. Well, I want to say something to you today. I want to say that grace is stronger than genetics. And our physical families will die. Many of us have begun to go through that grieving experience where we see a mom or a dad, a brother or a sister pass away. And it's a great pain, isn't it? But our faith family is an eternal family. Our brothers and sisters are people that will literally live all the days of our lives with God in eternity. It will never die. But who is that family? Well, Jesus says in Matthew 12, 50, anyone who does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. So if you think about the people who are with us on online church today who are following Jesus and trying to do his will, these are the brothers and sisters. This is the family that God is saying to you. This isn't just water being or blood being thicker than water. This is about grace being stronger than genetics. These are the people that you must love. These are the people that we must engage with on a daily basis. And you know, the word tells us how we are to treat the family of God. In fact, in 1 Timothy 5, 1 to 2, we're told that we mustn't rebuke an older man harshly, but we must exhort him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Can you see how the family of God is to operate? If there are people amongst us who are elderly or older than us, they are to be held in the highest honor, to be given the great regard and uh, and esteem that they are deserving of. If there are younger men and younger women in the congregation, treat one another as brothers and sisters. You need to know, look, the church is not some kind of dating agency. It's not somewhere that you go to flirt, convert, and to win a boyfriend or a girlfriend. It is a place for brothers and sisters to love one another as family. And so if you're thinking impure thoughts towards a brother or a sister in the house of God, then we're falling below the call that God has put on our lives. We're to love each other with holy thoughts. We're to love each other with pure thoughts and we're to treat one another as real family. Now, some of you may struggle with this and think, well, I, I know what you're saying, but how do we know that, that our grace family, our faith family is really to be like our flesh and blood family? Surely there's a difference. Well, There is a difference, Uh, and the difference is that actually your faith family is your priority. 
Faith family is where the Lord wants you to direct your attention. I want you to notice something. I wonder if you've ever thought about this. You know, in the word of God, we're told that Jesus did have earthly family. He had half brothers and sisters. They were born of Mary and Joseph. He, of course, was conceived in Mary by the power of the spirit and not born of the line of Joseph. So he was a half brother, but there were four brothers and there were two sisters. And in chapter seven of John's gospel, we're told actually that they would mock Jesus. His family mocked him about the miracles that he did. Uh, and we're actually told in John 7, 5, that they did not believe in him. It was only after the resurrection of Christ Jesus that his family actually began to believe in him. But think about this moment on the cross. There is Mary. She has family. She has four sons. She has two daughters. Surely what Jesus is about to do is to entrust her into the flesh and blood family's care. Isn't that what we would do? What did Jesus do from the cross? He looked at his apostle, John, and he said, Mother, you are now his mother. And John, you are now her son. Jesus entrusted his own mother to his faith family because grace is stronger than genetics. And we have got to start to learn this. We've got to start loving one another with a love that is different to the love that the world shows. We've got to love like God constantly overflowing, even if there is nothing in return. We've got to love without recording the wrongs done against us. We've got to love even when people hate us. We've got to love even when we could take offense because that's what it looks like to follow Jesus. And we have to grow up. Sometimes we're so immature as Christians and we take offense at this and we take offense as that. You got to stop being spiritual babies and grow up and love the way that Jesus loved. Think about it. One of those apostles was with him. Did he discard the rest? Did he come back to life after the tomb and say, well, none of you were at the cross. I'm so deeply offended with you. I'll never use any of you. No, he didn't. He recommissioned them. He loved them and he told them to love his sheep and feed them. That is the way of Jesus Christ. That is the way that we are called to love. And whenever there is an opportunity to do good, we're told in Galatians 6.10, do good to everyone, but especially to those in the household of faith. Why? Because grace is stronger than genetics. Here's a third way that we love like Jesus. I must recognize the pain in others even when I am in pain. You know, if there is one thing in us as human beings, I think that makes us utterly selfish and self-centered, it's pain. I mean, whether it's an emotional wound, a physical sickness, whether it's something that hurts me deeply, the more and more pain I experience, the more and more I tend to think about myself. It's just the natural way of mankind. You know, recently in a Premier League football match, I was watching the greatest team in the world, Liverpool, play and there is a young lad called Harvey Elliott, just an 18 year old boy, incredibly gifted player that's been playing for the first team. And he suffered a terrible ankle injury when his ankle was badly dislocated during a match. And I was interested to see that the first sound that left his mouth wasn't even a scream. He simply shouted out in agony these words, help me. Isn't that what we so often do when we're in pain? We just want everyone to stop and to notice my pain. But what about others? You see, the problem is that we are all going to th go through seasons where we experience long periods of pain. We're going to see our relatives slowly dying from time to time, and it's painful. We're going to go through relationship breakdowns, so we're going to have pain in the church with our friendships. There are going to be personal sicknesses that will go on for some time. But it's in these seasons where we have to ask Jesus to help us to be like him. We've got to help I got to get his help to see the pain in others, even when we ourselves are suffering. 
Think about this. For six hours, he hung, on, he hung on that cross in agony. And this is what he did. He ministered to his friends. He prayed for his persecutors to be forgiven. He led one man to salvation. He organized sheltered accommodation for his mom. And by the way, he did all of this while he was saving the whole world. That is what it's like to experience the power of Jesus, to be able to still function and to still see the needs of others, even when we ourselves are in terrible pain. But perhaps you think, no, no, that's not for us. That's just Jesus. He would never expect us to behave like that. He would never expect us to hold that standard. We can be self-centered in, in seasons of pain. Is that right? Is that what you believe? Because let me show you what the word of God says in 1 Peter 4, 1 to 2. It says this, so then since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude that he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. You see, pain is never an excuse to ignore the needs of other people. Pain is actually one of the ways that God allows us to seek him out and to discover that even when we are so terribly cut off, in our own anxiety and depression, that actually there is a way to overcome these things and to start to notice others. We're told to have the same mindset as Christ and even in our pain to function. And if we all did it, then when you're in pain, somebody will minister to you and you will minister to somebody else. And I know that some of you think this is just brutal, that's surely not what God would say. Well, actually, God would simply say to you, this is the way of my son, and you're being conformed into his likeness. So have his mindset amongst you. None of us can love this way. None of us can love like Jesus unless I am dead and it is Christ who lives in me. It's the only way, is to be filled with the Spirit of God and to see people the way that God sees them and to love the way that God loves. You know, whatever your cross, you need to remember, the Savior prayed for you when he was pinned to his. He saw your need and he saw my need, even in that moment of deepest pain. We have to have that mindset if we're going to be people who love like Jesus. Here's the final thing I want to say about loving like Jesus today. I must meet the needs of others even when my own personal needs are overlooked. You know, the world, I think, has a very different sense of priority to the kingdom of God. And in the world, the great are served by the insignificant. But this is not the way of Jesus. In the kingdom of God, the great serve the insignificant. God himself said he did not come in human form to be served, but to serve and you know, I notice even in the church that one of the things that so often stops us from loving other people the way that Jesus wants us to is when we feel our own personal needs are not being met. When I feel like I am being unnoticed and nobody sees my needs and they're not being cared for by the church. And, and often people kind of think, well, if nobody cares for me, then I will care for nobody. But it's not the way of God. That's not the way of love. True love pours out even when nothing is given in return. And if you're somebody that has invited 20 or 30 people from your church family to come and have dinner with you and they've never returned the invitation, do you know what? Just suck it up. It's okay. Just keep loving the way Jesus loves. Just keep giving the invites. If people don't invite you back, that means there's something wrong in our church culture and we need to deal with that. But as for you, keep modeling the ways of Jesus. Because if you don't model them and if you don't show people how Jesus loves, then how will those people who can't do that ever catch it if they don't see it? Because people catch who they see you are, not who you say you are. So keep loving like Jesus. If nobody ever helps you to put out chairs on a Sunday morning, don't worry about it. Just keep putting out the chairs. 
If you're sitting at home this morning and thinking, well, I've commented so many times and nobody ever gets back to my comment on online church, don't worry about it. Don't worry about your personal needs. Keep serving God's people. Keep loving the way that Jesus loves. Why? Because when Jesus hung on the cross for your sin and for my sin, he did not get down and abandon us because only one of his 11 were there. No, he went through with it and he said, I love them. He didn't say to the father after the disciples fell asleep and couldn't even stay awake to care for him. He didn't say to the father, they're not worth saving. No, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross because he could see that man could be reconciled to God. But it could only happen if one man modeled what love really looked like. And that man was Jesus Christ. And Jesus went to the grave in order that our sins would follow him and be buried and killed there. But on the third day, he raised back back to life and because he was raised in the power of the Holy Spirit we too can rise above sin and even the consequences of sin death we can have life in all its fullness because of what Jesus achieved for us on the cross and so we follow the words of Romans 15 2 to 3 that those of us who are strong and able in the faith need to step in and lend a hand to those who are weak and faltering and not just do what is most convenient for us Strength is for service, not status. Each one of us needs to look after the good of the people around us, asking ourselves, how can I help? You know, in a world where strength is for status, we have to say that's not the way of love. It's not the way of the kingdom. In the kingdom, great giftedness, great spiritual strength, is so that we can enable ourselves to become lowly, humble people who serve the weak and care for those who need to be strengthened. We have to learn to bear our crosses as Jesus bore his for us. We have to learn to love like Jesus. And as we read in Romans 12, 13, when God's people are in need, always be ready to help them, be eager to practice hospitality. There are four ways to love like Jesus. It starts in your family home. Care for your flesh and blood. Care for your children. Care for your grandparents. Care for your parents. Care for those who need help in the family. Then we love other believers as family. We recognize that when Jesus entrusted family to people on earth, he gave that person his mother to his friend John because grace is stronger than genetics. We need to love in a way that says, even when I'm in deep pain, I'm not going to ignore the pain of others, but I'm going to rise up and have the mindset of Christ Jesus who suffered for me, so I will suffer for him. And in suffering for him, people will be blessed by my life. And even when my needs are not met, I'm going to meet the needs of other people anyway. You know, the reason The word tells us that we love is this. We love because he first loved us. Everything we do is a response to Jesus. Everything we say should be a response to his kindness to us. Everything that we perform in this life should be a response to the gift of the cross, to the gift of God's great love, Jesus Christ. I don't know what God has been saying to you today, but I trust he has ministered to you. I trust even that if you're at home today because you're in pain and you can't get out to church, that the Lord will challenge you to rise out of your pain and to encourage somebody else. If you feel like somebody who's not having their needs met, then rise up and do things the way of Jesus. Allow his love to give you the power and the strength to care for other people because it's only then that we will see the church become what the church should be. A beautiful, spotless, blemish-free bride ready to be united with Christ on the day that he returns for her. We need his help. We can't do it on our own. And I want to pray for you today and ask that the Lord moves powerfully in your life. So if you're at home just now, why don't you just bow your head and let's pray together and ask the Holy Spirit just to move over us. Father God, we have heard of the great love of Jesus. 
We have heard about those final six hours of his life where even pinned to a cross in terrible agony, he did so many things to honor others and to save others and to order accommodation for his family. Lord, he is just the epitome of love. He is your nature in human form and we thank you for the gift and the example of Jesus. But Father, we confess to you today that so often we don't want to love like Jesus. So often we want to be people who are envious and jealous. We want to be people who hold on to the wrongs of others. We want to take offenses and grievances. And Lord, I pray that right now where people are struggling to love like Jesus, that you would bring breakthrough that where there is hardship in our hearts, Lord, or even self-centeredness, even if that self-centeredness comes understandably through our own human pain, Lord, I pray that you would break those strongholds today and set us free so that we can become a good example of Jesus, so that we can show the world what loving like Jesus really looks like. Would you help us, Lord, to be more like your Son? Holy Spirit, fill us today empower us with the resurrection power that raised Christ back to life. Lord, give us that power and let that course in us and out of us and through us and overpour like a waterfall of love into the lives of those who so desperately need to experience you today and this week. Would you help us, Lord, to reflect better the ways of Jesus? We ask for our benefit and all for your glory. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, we're going to respond to that word with a great song, First Love. I love the words of this song. And as you choose them, reflect on what has been taught today. Reflect on the example of Jesus. And let's give him all the glory as we stand to our feet, raise our hands, raise our voices, and praise him for the great gift of his love to us in Jesus. Amen.
chose the cross, you chose me. Surrendered your life, you chose me. Though I did not deserve, you chose me. Choose to love just as you chose me. I put you first as you first loved me. I'll treasure your grace as you died for me. You chose the cross. You chose me. Surrendered your life. You chose me. Though I did not deserve, you chose me. You're my first love. You're my true love. You're my reason. You are why I breathe. been so wonderful to be together today great having Matt with us to tell us about Williston and all that God is doing but I wonder Matt is there anything that you've heard today any kind of reflection on the word that we've just been speaking about or the way that Jesus loves us so one thing perhaps that has kind of struck you today in what God has been saying to us yeah I think the one thing for me actually was just about the one you know just there was one disciple out of the 11 that was there to enter into the the pain of Jesus and yeah. I think for me you know one of the hardest things of I guess following Jesus is that you know you always just want yourself to be all right you want your kind of family to be all right but then like to like enter into other people's pain or to I guess get beyond the surface of where they're at for me is something that really stood out you know that the other 10 could have been there, but they couldn't bear with the pain. Mm. And, and I just sense for us, you know, as people of God, you know, I think we can sometimes just not want time with others or not be willing to give the time because we're not willing to enter into the pain. Sure. And I just felt, you know, that's what Christ did for us. And I was just challenged listening to that word. You know, that's an attitude I want to want to give. I'm also thinking in terms of loving the lost. Sometimes, you know, you, you're reaching out and they're just hard. There's a lot mm. of brokenness and... You know, a lot of pain, and I, and I think actually sometimes we need to take the time to listen to their pain before then we can present and share Jesus with them to actually the healer of the pain. So yeah, yeah for me, the one takeaway is just simply this: we need to make sure we are willing to give time to enter into people's pain and love beyond ourselves, love yeah. how Christ loved us, and yeah, Jesus Christ on the cross was in ultimate pain, but yet he was still loving on us and others. I mean, what a lesson for us all. So that would be my uh, one takeaway from today. Yeah, that's awesome. That is a great place for us to bring our service to a close. It's been such a joy being with you guys today. We hope that you've been blessed. I do just want to remind you, if you want further information about anything that you've heard today, you can email us at info at livinghope.im. We'd love to speak to you. We'd love to connect with you. If you're new to church today and this is the first time you've experienced online church, we would love just to catch up with you. Uh, we'd love to meet you for coffee. We'd love to come and see you and encourage you if you're on the Isle of Man. If you're further afield, 
and let's connect online. If you would like any further information, we have starter packs, so we'll give you information about the church. Also includes, you'll have a New Testament, so if you need the Word of God and you don't have one at home, we can provide that for you. So please, again, email us at info at livinghope.im or contact us on 493-500 and we will get a pack out to you this week. But it has been so good being with you and thank you so much for joining us. We pray that you've been blessed. And as we close now, we're going to sing one final song, Father to Me. We're going to think about the Father's great love for us. He is the only one that can renew us. He's the only one that truly loves us in the way we need to be loved. So let's give him all the glory and let's worship our hearts out as we come to the close of today's service. God bless you and may his peace be with you.
father to me your hand is so mighty creation bows down proclaiming your majesty you are father to me The giggle at the start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To get the giggle, yeah, say the way first. I can never, when you're there, I can never look serious. Yeah, everyone needs a pomace in their life. <laughs> 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 okay, great. Right, we'll